Welcome back to the Level 1 Coaching Podcast. Drew Carlson here with you. You'll hear Mikhail in a second. Uh, Episode 4, we are going to talk about basically two themes, but it's really one. Um, We're going to talk about how the edge is you and this idea of reducing importance. So kind of what spurred this on Mikhail just wrote an article for his personal blog. We will link that in the show notes. Feel free to pause this right now and read it, but we're going to dive a little bit into that. And then where again, and like just for some reference for you guys, we talk about how as level one coaches, like it's as easy as kind of what we're doing right now. We're modeling it in real time. So like Mikhail wrote an article um, I had some thoughts on it, reached out to him, shared a couple audio messages, a couple text messages. Obviously, we're talking about this podcast, but if we weren't doing a podcast, it's as simple as that. Like if people are open sourcing stuff that you're reading, reach out to them, join the conversation, connect, and you never know what's going to happen. So with that little kind of tidbit of advice, uh, I'm going to kick it to Mikhail and he's going to preface the article a bit and then we'll just get right into it so so first of all i would say yeah like it is nice to hear um even if it's maybe our the the thoughts are contrary to what you wrote it's nice to hear back like just it gives you a different perspective um the one that obviously as like the person who wrote it uh, if, if you have a different perspective than i did then it's interesting for me to hear and It also, to me, is like that's why you write it is to hear like, sure that was uh that was that was cool or that wasn't cool or whatever. Um, So it's nice to hear that because it helps you helps you grow and helps you learn. Uh, It definitely is helpful too, like to know what kind of things people are interested in reading. There's certain things that maybe there's not an audience for, so it's it's always helpful to hear that whether it's positive or negative feedback. Having said that, the the thought process behind this article for me was more like it was really spurred mostly by John Cooper and Jared Bednar, um, just because they were the most recent Stanley Cup winners. And then I just looked a little deeper and I feel like just the last three years or um, two Stanley Cup winning teams is kind of a small sample size. So I went back and looked at some other coaches. But on the surface, like what doesn't make sense is how, and John Cooper's so heavily covered, but I mean, it's just like, it's a very current relevant example, but it doesn't necessarily make sense how someone who didn't play anywhere close to professional level can be that good of a coach. And like, whether you measure a good coach by wins and losses, by being well-liked, by having good sound bites, like I'm pretty sure he checks off all those boxes, (laughs) whether, he certainly does winning. I, I feel like anyone that I've heard who played for him or worked with him has enjoyed him. Um, so he checks off that box and he's certainly entertaining to listen to. And I feel like he has great insight that isn't necessarily about getting pucks deep and, and, <laughs> and establishing the four check. Um, as, as much as those are important, like they actually are, they do matter, right. but it's like the only thing that is said on any pre or post game show. And it's like, there's so much more than just establishing a four check um, side. That's a side side. note. <laughs> but in Jared Bender is a little bit different, but similar in that like he played, I mean, most of his career in the ECHL um, a little bit in the AHL and uh, you know, now he's coaching like Camel Carr. I know they just got eliminated, but, regardless, won the cup last year, you're coaching Nathan McKinnon and Gabe Landeskog, like some of the best players of their generations. And to me, that's like that, that ability or their ability to do that, like needs to be pride and looked into more, um, pride open a little bit, like how the hell are these guys doing that? Um, and I guess when I, when I look deeper then there's other examples with Mike Sullivan, Joel Quenville, Barube, and uh, Daryl Sutter, who was obviously just fired from a different team. But those guys had NHL playing careers. But even when you look at their playing careers, they're not, they were never on the level of, call it top guy on their team. Um, at most, they were 
averaging around, you know, half a point a game. Um, and that was really only one of them. The rest were well, well below that. And that's not to say that that's not, I mean, that is way more impressive than anything you or I ever did while playing hockey. So it's not like that's not a good benchmark for success. But when you're talking again about coaching Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin and Chris Tang to back-to-back Stanley Cups, and you had like 170 points in your NHL career, it's like, what? Sorry, 136. Like, how did, how are you, how are you achieving that? How are you doing that? So that's what really spurred my desire to look into it. Maybe if you want to talk about some of the things that either stuck out to you or that resonated with you. Yeah, obviously like we're doing this podcast and we've communicated pretty much nonstop since the start of it three or four weeks ago. And just some of the conversation that we've had and viewing it or starting to view more things through this level one coach lens or uh, my other platform, like the new wave coach kind of pulling on similar threads. Um, but like the Cooper and the Bednars of the world are, I mean, they are level one coaches that turn level 50. And we've talked in the first three episodes about kind of what that looks like and how like Cooper and Bednar were those high velocity people that made it out of level one and now are at the highest level um, with the perspectives that they've had from the bottom. So like looking at Cooper um, and we're talking about like reducing importance, I think. um, And just to kind of tee that up, like that's where my brain went um, when I read your article, like I immediately went to this theme of like reducing importance. And what that means essentially is like, there's, we think as coaches that like, there's a difference between what's important for the players and from a, like a user experience perspective and what's important to us. So we've talked on previous articles about like coaches that stay up till two thirty after game five in the morning and cut film. And can you take that information and 9,004 check clips from the previous four games and from 11 at night when the game ends till two thirty in the morning, find something that you can successfully impart on your team at eight in the morning, nine in the morning at the meeting. Um, and sometimes the answer might be yes, but I think in a lot of cases it's important for us as the coach and it's a little bit of like signaling. Um, and we can link an article that talks about that too, for a little bit more context, not to get like way off track here, but I think a lot of what we're doing and a lot of the problems that we run into are signaling that things are important to us as coaches versus what the players actually find useful, beneficial, and can make a difference day to day or game to game or with any game in their lives. So that's where I initially went with it. Um, If you want to hop in and add anything to that, uh, feel free. Yeah. So that's actually not something that I was thinking when I was writing it, but again, that's why it's good to hear this. Like, I think that that piece is absolutely true. I think so often you're, um, you know, when you're trying to give advice, even outside of coaching, just in general, like you go off of what worked for you. So you're like, if someone's like, I'm having a really hard time getting up early for you, what works is going to bed early, but for them, they're not going to be able to do that. So they've got to figure out something else to be able to get up early, but you don't, you're not them. You don't know that. So you, you end up giving probably less than great advice because you're only looking at what you would have done. And I think in coaching, like, sir, I mean, I still do it. And I, especially when I first started, I would find myself like someone's talking about struggling with this or um, not knowing how to prepare or not knowing how to, I don't know, whatever it is. And um, my immediate response 
would be like, well, when I was playing, this is what I did. And it's like, yeah, that's, that doesn't help because they're not you unless, unless you found the closest guy to you that's out there, it's probably not going to work for them quite as well as it did for you. And as it pertains to this article, like where, where that ties in is like, I, you know, I gave an example of, um, this cricket batsman, uh, batter and essentially how they were, had always been one of the best young prodigies in England. Um, and had a bunch of, as they got older, hired a bunch of coaches to help them. And all these coaches basically just messed up his swing and made him worse. And then, uh, all these, these coaches were famous batters themselves. And finally he found a guy who was never a great batter himself, who brought him to maybe the level that he always should have been at or could have been at. And that coach was able to just look at his swing and what his strengths and weaknesses were and build around those. And the other coaches who had been great batters themselves, they were trying to impart their own uh, tactics and their own strategies on him, on this batter, but he wasn't them. And I think, you know, I don't, I'm not in an NHL locker room or I never have been. So I, I don't know what, um, you know, I don't know what someone like Rod Brendan Moore says versus what someone like, John Cooper says, who have very different playing career experiences. Uh, and, and Rod Brennamore may not be the best example because I personally really respect him and think he does a great job. So probably not someone I'm putting in that, that category necessarily. But like, I think it's definitely true that guys like Bedner or guys like Cooper that maybe didn't have this extensive playing career in the NHL and haven't seen things done a certain way at that level for years and years and years and become accustomed to like, well, we run X for check or we do this PK or we, maybe it's not even that we always practice day after a game because like, that's how it was when I played and their mindset to me is just like, it's so different because they don't have any of that stuff to go off of. And they're just like, Let's look at this objectively. Like, is it is it a good idea to skate tomorrow at noon when we played last night at eight and then we flew to whatever city and we didn't sleep much? Like, no, I don't care how much better our power play needs to get. Like that one hour of ice is going to do more harm than good from a physical standpoint, a mental standpoint, maybe both. Um, but if you're really ingrained in your ways, because when you were on the flames, every time you flew to Vancouver, you always practiced. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're going to do, maybe sometimes that's going to be good and you're going to be glad you did that, but maybe sometimes you're going to, you know, you're going to miss your shot a little bit and maybe you should have been more open-minded. So I, I really think to me, like, and there's probably a lot of explanations and it's not just this, but something that I certainly think helps guys like Cooper and Bednar is their ability to, look at things with a completely different perspective and have a very open mind and like the truest sense of that word and not just, Oh, I'm open-minded, but I'm going to go do what I've always done anyways, like really open to doing things differently because they have this beginner's mindset to it. They don't have a bunch of entrenched beliefs based on their playing career and, and how long they've been, doing the same thing at the same level with the same guys. Um, to me, I think that it explains part of it. it I, I, there's a million variables that go into that, but I think that's, that's part of it. Yeah. It like the word that comes up is, or the phrase that comes up for me when you're saying that is there's just no template. There's no, I've talked about in the book, like we have, like, I think a lot of our, issues in coaching is the self-perpetuation problem where you come out of playing pro hockey, you work for a buddy of the coach that you just finished playing for. Um, you learn under that guy and then you get kind of entrenched or this is you, you think this is how the East coast league is supposed to work. Cause one, I played here and now I'm coaching here and it's the same operating where you played and where you're coaching now because the coach that you were playing for has a buddy that you're now coaching under. So it's same, same. And then 
you start to get these entrenched beliefs and there is a template to work from. And this is what we do on a game day. And this is what we do. We always pregame skate. We always travel by plane to these places, bus to these places and whatever it is. So there's a template to work from in a lot of cases. And I think that's where we talk about like the theme of the episode. One of them is the edge is you. And if there's no template and you're John Cooper, or like I had this experience being a tier three head coach at 26, um, that was essentially my first job. I was an assistant for like three months the year before that, but not a full year. And it was for basically like an anti-mentor type guy. So I didn't exactly want to copy and paste his template. So like when I came in and started being a head coach, like there was no template for me either. So I, I had the ability to experiment and try things. And, you know, I, we did things this way in college, but maybe that's not the right way to do it and let's start questioning and let's start getting into the first principles of this and like how might this work better and when you start from like questioning things instead of blindly copying I think things go um or can go in a better direction for you um talk to me about we were talking off air and we're talking about and this is how kind of both of these ideas the edge is you and reducing importance kind of tie in. So talk to me about this John Cooper kickball story you heard in Traverse City. Yeah. So uh, one of the speakers at the convention was talking about um, being at the Traverse City like rookie camp, which is usually I think it's like eight teams. And uh, I, I, I don't remember exactly what year it was that this that Cooper was the head coach in the AHL for Syracuse. I want to say it was early on, um, but I don't remember exactly. But anyway, he was head coach, obviously, with Syracuse. First um, thing you do as a team, and they're down in Traverse City. And what I do remember is this speaker saying that this was not a team that had any current or future NHLers on it. So it wasn't like a loaded team with an Alex Kalorn or any of those type of guys that then moved up. Um, Tyler Johnson, all that. So they're there. Um, and the speaker is like, I, you know, I, I was meeting with him and I wanted to show him some video and like go, go over it with him and, uh, kind of like, you know, like impress him in a good way, but also like learn from him and him and Cooper sat down and they might've talked for a couple minutes. And eventually at one point Cooper was just like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think I need to see all this. I trust you. Like I'm going to go take care of some other things. And wasn't going to nitpick or, or really not that he wasn't going to pay attention to it, but it was like, if you're going to handle these three things on video, like I trust you to do that and take care of it. I don't, I don't need to micromanage how you do it, what you're doing and the way you present it. And so anyway, then they play, like, I think they play four games there. I can't remember exactly, but they played two to start and they had a day off where you practice. And so this Syracuse team won their first two games. And now they are, uh, now they're going to um, that third day of practice and trainers and like medical staff are all down in the locker room at the rink waiting to start practice or help guys, you know, get prepared before practice, taping up, whatever. And they're like, where, where are the lightning guys? Which I, I'm saying Syracuse, I guess he's the coach in Syracuse, but I guess these are technically lightning guys, lightning prospects. Um and they're like, where, so where's Tampa's team here? And they're not in the rink. And I guess out, out back behind the rink, there is a uh, baseball field. And the whole team, including Cooper, is playing kickball. And they didn't skate that day. They just didn't, didn't have practice. And I believe uh, the speaker had said that this, this team went on to finish fourth out of eight in Traverse City, which – he was pretty adamant that for that team was good um, at that time. And like, I guess what I love about that or what I find is, is so like, so interesting is like how often, and I, I think I even would be in this category for sure until I heard the story, like how often would you be like, we won two, that's good, but we've got X amount left. We got a day to practice. Let's try to, 
fine tune some things. You know, I'm a I'm a head coach in the AHL. I want to show that I can do this. Um, let's get on the ice and run through 50 minutes of skating. Whatever. He doesn't even like. He's not even coming close to that. Like he's playing kickball, and not only is like the team playing kickball, like he's in on the game too, which just shows like you can't be a thumb and have your team enjoy you being around. Like you got to be a likable guy that's um, that's able to relate to them and like able to connect with them just on like a human level, totally outside of the sport. And so, to me, like I think that's that's fascinating. Um, one part because like i said you're, you're trying to prove that you can do this and you know what you're doing and let's get on the ice and let me run a practice that part of it but also the aspect of like i'm 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 a good enough connector and relator that i can just hang out with these guys as if i'm on the team even though i'm such an outsider i never even came close to being as good as any of these guys at the sport they're playing um which like whether we like it or not, there's a certain credibility that everyone either carries or doesn't carry. And it doesn't mean that if you don't carry it, you can't be a good coach, but you're, you've got to, you've got to really lift your game in other areas in order to, to get that acceptance, I think. Um, and like plenty of coaches can't do that. He could, or he does. So that, and that's not even getting into the fact that like preceding all of this, he sits down and goes over some video and is like, you got it, man. I trust you. Like that part is just like also unreal. Like he doesn't need to, as a head coach, like you've got so many things on your plate. If you micromanage something like video in Traverse city, that's probably not going to be the best allocation of your time. He understands that he's obviously been a head coach at that point. He had been a head coach for years and years already, but regardless, like to have that insight and mindset, like that's, that's to me next level. Yeah. The thread that I pulled on off that was getting to this idea of like reducing importance. But before I go there, I think like what you're saying and you've mentioned the word liked um, a couple times and I've written an article and I truly believe just like when you study these, some of these level one guys that we've either studied or we know um, a guy like Ryan Orsoffs, he comes to mind uh, listening to him talk. And I truly think these new wave minded, these level one coaches that are going to be high velocity coaches. Like if you're a young coach and I think the new principles are liked and respected and the old guard will fucking be on this podcast and turn it off. Um, because you have to be just respected. And again, like there's a template for what it used to look like. And I just don't think it looks like that anymore. And like guys like Bednar that have fun as a pillar in their culture and Cooper, who's out playing kickball and the guys are having an off day and not skating. Um, when everyone else at the tournament was like probably looking around, like, why aren't these guys using their ice time? Like, this isn't what we would do normally. Um, and that's part of like embracing the edge and going it your own way without a template and this idea of like reducing importance, which I'm getting back to. So, um, not taking yourself too seriously and not taking your job too seriously. Like Eminem has a verse in Cinderella man, and it's the very beginning of the song. And he says, like, I'm not supposed to be here right now, so let's make the most of it. And I think, like, that's the anthem to some of these high-velocity coaches that are making it from Tier 3 Metro Jets like Cooper to the NHL, where you're essentially playing with house money. So if you are, why not go at it 100% your way and let the chips fall where they may? Because, I mean, the alternative is if you have that far to climb, you can do it by the template, but you're playing the same game as everyone else is playing. Or you can play in a different game. And that's showing to be the accelerant to why they are where they are, if you want to build on that at all. Yeah, yeah. Like what I, <clears throat> what comes to mind for me is like, like when you say that, that Eminem lyric and, and this like, 
ability to just like lean into yourself and you being your biggest asset. Like these guys that we're talking about now, like, like th this same speaker gave a, he showed an, an interview of John Cooper um, in what I believe was game six of one of the series last year. And one the reporter asked him, it was on the bench. The reporter was like, are you nervous? Like she asked him a question and he answered and he's like, are you nervous? And he like, he like laughed. And some of you may remember this. Uh, some of you listening may remember this because it was kind of like hot on Twitter for a little bit. I wrote kind of laughed. <laughs> you did? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so he like, he laughed and he's like, nervous like coaching the best league in the world like mm -hmm. this is so fun this is awesome and like that that could be manufactured and he could be trying to make himself believe that but like think about it if you're actually in game six of the stanley cup playoffs and that's your response on the bench when probably your responses on the bench are either off the cuff or pre-programmed pre-programmed meaning like you just are always going to say this Either way, if it's just off the cuff or something he always says, probably true and probably authentic to who he is and how he operates. And so, like, if you have that mindset that's just like, this is awesome and I'm happy to be here, then, like, you're free. Like, you don't have, quote, anything to lose. Um, and on the flip side of that, if you are, like, tense and nervous and you're like, I don't want to screw this up. I want to make sure we win. Like, now you have a lot to lose. And now you're not free at all. And, you know, the role of the coach is, it's diminished um, compared to the player as it, as it should be. So we have to have every detail planned out. We're very meticulous for practice because that's your opportunity to make your team better. And then the way that players prepare for a game is much different than how a coach does. Not that you're not prepared, but like, if you did a good job and you really poured everything you could into your week of practice, by the time you get to the game, you're on autopilot. Like, yeah, you're going to, depending on your role, um, whether you're, you know, head or assistant, you might have different responsibilities, forwards, the special teams, face-off plays. But to a certain extent, like, the, the team is now running itself. And you can make adjustments here and there. Um, my point of that is like, if you are tense and nervous, that decision-making in the game and the, your ability to see clearly what your team needs to do is, is greatly affected by the fact that you're tense and nervous and you feel like you got something to lose if you screw up here. But if you're sitting there like Cooper is, and you're actually just having the time of your life, which I feel like was a direct quote of what he said, having the time of my life or something like that. Like, I just feel like you're going to make a decision as free as you possibly can be, which will open your mind up to as many possibilities as there are, and will ultimately lead to whatever decision you make, you being content with, your team being content with, and them, like them meaning the team knowing that like you're operating at the best of your ability. And if it didn't work out, like that's okay because you weren't cowered down in the corner freaking out because you were so nervous or you weren't walking off the bench because you're puking like you, you were you were ready and hey this is what i thought we should do it didn't work but we'll try next time um so i don't know if that exactly answers how you were framing it but yeah i mean what it what it makes me think of and like building off of that what level one coaches eventually will have if you make it to level 50 or you just keep advancing if you start at the bottom like and the article that um, I was referencing that Mikhail was just going through that situation um, was about contrasting. And it's just a mental model where John Cooper knows what it's like to be sitting in a broom closet, essentially, in the Lakeland Ice Arena in Michigan, coaching the Metro Jets when they played at Lakeland. Um, he knows what that looks like. He knows what that is on a scale of zero to 10 in comparison to what it's like being at Amelie arena in the coach's office in an NHL building with multiple rings on his finger. So the contrast of that was a zero out of 10. And this is a 12 out of 10 um, gives him so much perspective and he hasn't forgotten where he's come from which is the best part of it because a lot of coaches will get to that level. And I mean, we've experienced it. They'll 
not give you the time of the day. They'll shit on you, uh, whatever. And the guys that don't lose sight of where they came from are the best people to be around. Um, and those are people that will see value in level one coaches now. So they're again, circling back a couple episodes. They're open to more ideas from more people because they used to be, call it me and Nikhil. Yeah. Like he, he knows, it's what you said. He knows what it's like to be at call it the bottom of the bottom. So now when he's at the, the very highest level you can be at, it's like, I'm not like, I know what that's like. I know what this is like. This isn't bad game six. Yeah. I, I want to win, but like, am I nervous? Like, no, being nervous is like wondering if you're going to lose your job coaching the Metro Jets and the central States hockey league, because you just lost 10 games in a row. That's nervous. Like, or thinking like, did I really leave a career in law for this? That's <laughs> nervous. This is like, what's the worst that can happen to me? Um, and it's, a, it's actually, fun, oddly enough, like not an intended direction that we're now talking about. But the guy, the same speaker I was referencing earlier, that was the premise of everything he was talking about was as a coach or a player for that matter, can you find a way to operate at a level where you feel like you have nothing to lose and operate at a level, meaning not playing level, but like a self ability to coach and make decisions and think not in terms of if I do this, what's going to, what, what's going to consequence going to be. If I pull my goalie with four minutes left, am I going to get scored on? And then we're going to be down two goals. And then I'm going to look like an idiot because I should have waited another two minutes or Hey, three and a half minutes left. We got a power play. I'm going six on four. Obviously I'm talking about Quinnipiac here <laughs> and we win the national championship or we force overtime. Like, Pagnol making that decision is he's not afraid to lose. He is operating at a level where he's thinking about, is this going to give us a chance to win? And is this the right thing to do? In my opinion, at the right, at the right time. Yes. Okay. Do it. I don't care about the negative consequences. Of course, I, I don't want them to happen, but I'm not going to not act here in fear of the negative consequences. And that, that speaker's whole, intention behind this was like, can you, can you get yourself to coach every day consistently operating where all you're really concerned with is like, what's best for the team and how best can we achieve that? And we all want to do that, but it's natural for all of us to be like, well, if I change this line and I, that messes up the chemistry that they had, then in two weeks, they're going to look back and be like, why did you change us? We should have just stuck with it. Like, then you get in this like second guessing, like you get in this whole negative thought wheel that I have gone down hundreds of times. So I'm, I'm saying this is his, this is the speaker's uh, whole premise. Like I gotta get way better at this. This is hard to do. Um, but you look at Cooper, you look at Bednar, like you've talked about uh, Jared Bednar's pillar of just fun for the Colorado Avalanche. Like you're telling me that you're afraid you're playing that you are, afraid to lose when fun is your pillar. Like, no, you're not afraid of losing. You're not afraid to lose anything. If that's one of your pillars, you're there to have fun and win in that process. And like, you're not afraid of, you're not operating at like, Oh, I don't want to lose. And that that's a, a little different note than what we kind of started talking about. But to me, it's, it's all tied in where like, that's, that's a huge component of, being a John Cooper, a Jared Bednar type coach where like, you're not afraid to lose because you've, you've seen, I guess, quote, how bad it could be. And you're also looking at it now. Like, why would I, why would I make decisions um, for any other reason than to, to try to win? And if it doesn't work, who cares? It's not, I'm not, I'm not thinking like that. Yeah. I mean, both of the mindsets, like the edge is you, um, what what they're doing and what you're saying, like the word that comes to mind is unlimited and unlimiting. Like they're not living in this like self-preservation, which a lot of coaches are, or this fear of, again, losing. They're just going for it, like pull the ripcord like all the way and just go for it. 
and what that's doing. And you can talk about the speaker uh, has a pretty good story. And then I can tell a personal story that I really resonated after you told me that. But like we've had, we've both went through situations where we've been unlimited and we've gone for it. And then there's still this like, if you listen to these thoughts that come in and you're not coaching with your gut and you're not staying with it and you're feeding into kind of the mind instead of the heart, um, how that can kind of get you off track. So if you want to talk about kind of the story he told, and then I've got a personal one that kind of pulls on the same thread. Yeah. The, the example that he gave was, so it was his first coaching job, um, second division pro team in Europe. And he got there and the general manager, this was back in the nineties before the days of Instagram and Twitter, um, general manager had no idea that he was that young and had never coached before. So he was like, you have till Christmas and then we'll decide if we're really going to hire you. And so I think they, he said they rattled off like seven wins to start the year. And by Christmas time, um, he was offered a, a contract extension for two years. And what he explained was like in that first half of the year before Christmas, he was like, what do I have to lose? Like, I got nothing to lose here. I'm probably going to get let go of. And no one here expects me to be able to coach this team. So I may as well just do whatever I want. And whatever I think is right or whatever I see fit at the time, just do it. Don't even don't even get into a second guessing game because this job is not mine come January 1st. And then he gets the, the contract extension. He's got, I think it was two years. And he said for a lot of the next two years, he struggled to find that same success, whether it was with the team or his ability to coach them or all the above. Um, he really struggled to achieve that same level that he did in the, in the first couple months of his job. And it took him, I think, years to realize this. But once he got that contract extension, now he had something to lose. He had a job to lose. And there was security in the extension, but like insecurity in the fact that now if you lose that, you screwed up. And being afraid of being fired, players not liking you, um, just that whole idea that now he has something to lose and it alters everything that he did that got him to be successful in the first place. And so finding a way to have something to lose in that two-year contract that you do could potentially lose it but still play in the same way or coach in the same way that you did when you didn't have anything to lose at all. Um, if you can marry the best of those two, you marry that job security or that security as a player on whatever team you're on with the free mindset of like, I'm probably going to get cut anyway, so I may as well just go out and have fun. You can marry those two. Like you, you find your John Coopers of the world. Yeah. And like when you told me that I was thinking back to when I was coaching the junior team and I had kind of like a similar struggle for different reasons. And it's crazy how we can kind of, again, like I was kind of talking about get wrapped up in our own head and in our own way, even though we might have like complete and total freedom and autonomy. So like the guy that I worked for, uh, he's like, you're a young coach you're we're doing this to put you on a platform so you can eventually advance and move on and he's like i'm not gonna fire you so if there's you know a time that you want to walk away for whatever reason i mean pep guardiola has walked away from barcelona so like there's a time for coaches that like whether they lose the room whether it's time to move on whether the voice gets tired but whatever um he expressed that he wasn't going to fire me. So like my job was safe. I had, you know, psychological safety, whatever the term. And I could have just leaned all the way into my ideas without fail. And at first I did, and I started experimenting and I wasn't doing it from the template that my college coach did when I was a player. Um, I was doing it my way. And we won the first game both years. Um, and then we started kind of getting beat around both years. So losing, um, as much as 
I want to say didn't affect me because I knew what the long-term goal was. And it was about player development at the level that I was at. And that's what we strived for. It doesn't mean that it didn't affect the players, which then affects me. So by way of that, like the players start talking, the players start looking around, the players might not trust you as much if you don't start winning right away. Like the buy-in kind of at first hangs on that a bit. So if you're not winning, um, there's a better than not chance you can lose the room quicker than normal. And when I felt like I was, then you start getting into that self-preservation mode, which now in retrospect, I'm saying to avoid. Um, didn't have that perspective at the time. So then you start kind of scrambling like a fish out of water. And you're like, I need to change a couple different things. And then you might start regressing to that coach I played for in college that I didn't even like. And you start like, taking plays from his playbook on how to do things. And then all of a sudden, the authenticity, the edge of what you were doing and what you believe in goes away and you become someone else. So whether it's through getting a contract and getting safety or whether it's through being told that you're not going to get fired ever, um, you can still kind of end up in the same place. So I thought that was kind of uh, unique. Uh, if you want to build or add, or if you have a personal experience too that you want to share. Yeah. One, uh, one that actually comes to mind for me is like, and I, I think it's interesting what you're saying, like whether you're told the worst thing in the world or the best thing in the world, like you could still end up at the same self-preservation and self-questioning mode uh, because it is, it's very natural and instinctual. And it, I do have a personal example, but on that note, like to get, you know, this speaker has now worked 30 years on developing a different mindset for himself and, and, um, literally spending 15 to 30 minutes a day, three to five times a week, like mentally exercising this mindset, just like you would go to the gym and like jump on the stair stepper. He's doing this mentally to try to train his, his own mind. Um, but he gave an example of like, he's now a head coach in Europe and, um, got a call from his general manager trying to sign a player and the player was like, Oh, I don't, I don't want to play for that head coach. I haven't heard great things. And he was like a year or two ago, that would have driven me nuts. And I would have been so mad that a player thinks that I'm not a good coach and he doesn't want to play for me. And it just would have eaten at me. Like, why does he think that? And I would want to get to the bottom of it. And now I'm like, if he doesn't like, if he doesn't know me one, and if he doesn't want to play for me because of that, whatever reason or reasons that he's heard, fine. That's one guy that doesn't want to play for me. And what you're, it's, I think it's similar to what you're talking about of like, you start questioning, like, what do the players think of me? Do they like me? Do they want to play for me? What are their, what are they saying when I'm not around? All that, all that stuff creeps into your mind. And it's one of the hardest things to shut off is like, just don't act, don't go there because it doesn't matter. Um, and a lot of times it's like, I, I forget where I read this, but in terms of like, when you, when you picture your worst nightmare in a situation, like if your worst nightmare is to get up in front of a, a huge audience to give a talk and have your voice crack and burp, like the odds that those two things happen are so low that like whatever your worst nightmare is, is probably not going to happen. But that's what we will spend all our time worrying about. Um, so that's that just was an example that came to mind for me uh, when you were talking about that. But a personal scenario like happened this past season uh, with our team at Tufts. Like we we had a really tough weekend the beginning of February. Um, we got swept by a team that was ranked below us in the standings that we felt like going into it. Like we've got a good chance to I think we were an eighth going into that weekend out of ten. So we felt like this would probably give us a chance to like get up into like sixth or who knows, maybe seventh, whatever. And like we got swept. So we dropped to ninth and this team was in tenth. So at that point we had four games left in our season. We're in ninth place, only eight make playoffs. Like we're only out of eighth by I think like a point, but still like now you have, we had two weekends against three and five and four and six. So all teams ahead of us, all teams that were, in playoffs and 
you know, call it not the seven or eight seed. So doing pretty well at the time. And it was like, wait, what do we have to lose at this point? Like we have, we've hit kind of rock bottom for our season right now. And <clears throat> we did probably a number of things that helped. Um, like we took a day off when we normally don't do that. We adjusted uh, one of our special teams when we hadn't really done that either. Actually, both of our special teams when we hadn't done that. Uh, we hadn't adjusted both simultaneously all year. But for me, like what I also remember doing much differently was like we got into the first of that those four games and then it ultimately ended up being all four and even our last playoff game um, where normally like some game scenario occurs and like – like a reflex, I act a certain way. So I'm running the forwards and we get into under 10 minutes and we're we're in a tie game. And my instant reflex is, okay, only two lines play now because we're tied and I don't want to lose this game. So I'm not, I don't trust X line. And it's not always, it's not like top two lines. It's just like, it could be the third line, third line. It could be the fourth line, like who knows. But um or it's certain players, like all of a sudden, like certain players aren't going to go out because I don't have the trust in them. And for the next four games, I just was like, and like I said, started that first game, but I was like, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just gonna, like, it didn't work. I've been doing that all year and it's not working because we're not winning more than we're losing. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm going to do it differently. And like that first game, we had to kill off a five minute major and, uh, so only the penalty kill guys played and we won two to nothing. And then the next night we had to kill off uh six on four at the end for a little bit. And we won two to one and different guys played. And then our last two games of the year, like same thing. It, I didn't take the same approach of like limiting the bench and only playing certain guys. Um, and even when we're tied, like just being much more open-minded because it hadn't worked in the past. And we end up winning all four of those games and going from ninth to sixth place and uh and making playoffs and like and making playoffs by a very comfortable amount it wasn't we weren't nervous i guess uh, and when i look back on that like then it once we started doing that in that first of those four games like then it became a flywheel where i just i kept doing it because it was working and now i gotta honestly reevaluate like is that gonna work again next year i don't know i've got to think about that um, but it all only occurred because I was actually operating and I didn't think about this until the speaker said it, but I was operating at that point as if I had nothing to lose because we weren't making playoffs. And that's like the most gut wrenching thing that can occur when you coach a college is to not make playoffs. It's what you're trying. You are literally trying to avoid that all year long as uh, funny as that wording is, it's what you're trying to do. You're just like, don't finish in ninth or 10th because we don't get to play playoffs then. So you're trying to avoid that all year long and you find yourself in that spot and you're like, fuck it. Like, what do I have to lose at this point? May as well just do things differently, switch it up. All the shit I was doing before wasn't working. So let's throw it out the window and try something new. And like all year long, I had been afraid to do that. I had been afraid to maybe adjust drastically the way I was running the bench, or we had been afraid to tell our power play to totally abort what it had been doing for the previous 10 games and try something new. And lo and behold, like we end up doing that, meaning I end up doing the bench differently. We end up doing our special teams differently. And that, that flew in the face of all of our like intuition and like general gut feeling of like, I don't know, changing all this right now with four games left. That's a lot. And you don't want to do that during the regular season because you're worried about it impacting negatively. You go out and do it and you win four in a row and like you get into playoffs. So I think it's like that ability to operate like you have nothing to lose. I mean, it, it, it might be it might be one of the most interesting things I've heard in a long time as far as getting your yourself to a mindset where you can really be at your best. Yeah. And it almost, I'm curious if you've, now that we're kind of on this topic, um, just going off of what you said, do you, like, it It almost seems to me, I'm wondering what your thoughts are, like, and I don't know if you had any experience with this term before we started talking about it, 
um, earlier today off air, but like you in a way like reduced importance and it, it was like a self importance. Um, and I don't want to like lead you anywhere. Does that, does that take you anywhere in your mind or do you want to give, or do you want me to give you a little bit more? Well, give me a little more just so I'm, um, I think I know where you're going with this, but I don't want to mm-hmm. go on a different tangent than you had in mind. Yeah. So like this, it's, it's like a self-importance thing, whether you might've realized it or not. And just from where my perspective over here, hearing mm-hmm. you say it, but you had this idea that whether it was, you know, a template that you've always had or a template that you've carried with you from a previous coach, or just you were very strong in this idea that it would be important, whether for yourself to make that decision or just for the team in general um, to shorten the bench. Does that make sense? Like from a, yeah. And then, yeah. and then reduce, go ahead. Yeah, honestly. And I've never, this is the first time I've spoken this or thought about this out loud. So what I really think it was is that prior to being here at Tufts, like the, the team that I was coaching before the conference was much different. So you had like, and I played in that same conference. So I knew it like the back of my hand and I knew that the top four teams were really good. And the next four, it's not that they weren't good, but it was a much different game playing those four and you could still lose and you do, you do still lose sometimes. But if you go in there and you play the way that you're a top four team does. And and when I was at the previous squad, I was asked Curry, when I was at Curry, we were a top four team both years. If you went and played kind of like the way that you wanted to, um, which I, I know is being vague, which is not worth getting into like what we did to be good or try to sure. be good. But like, if you, if you did that, you were going to come out. Okay. And I think in the two years that I was there, we only dropped one game to those teams that, you know, were not in the top four with us. And when I got here to Tufts, this is a much different conference. Like I, I think at the top um, of the previous conference I was at, those, those four are, just on par with they're on par or better than all these, the teams in our conference now, but the difference is our conference now is full of 10 teams that are essentially that good. Or if they're not that good on a certain year, the very next year they could be, I mean, Amherst college is a team in our conference this year that I think last year was like in the bottom four of the NESCAC. And then this year they were third, they were like 15 and six. They were really good. They beat us in playoffs in overtime. Um, And they were like just outside of the top 15 rankings all year long. But the year before, they weren't not even close to that. So it's like that it's the most overused word in the NHL language parody, like the parody is really good. And so I think I knew that coming in, even though I hadn't ever coached in it. And so I think the reason that I operated in the way you're talking about where I was shortening the bench, thinking overthinking was like, well, I know this league is really tight. I know it's hard to win. And I know it's a little bit different than where I was at before. So what I need to do is make sure that we just don't lose. (laughs) That's literally like what I'm thinking. Like I got to make sure that I don't make a call that ends up with us losing the game. So whether that's, I put a certain line out or a certain um, power play or penalty kill or deep pairing, whatever it is, I got to make sure that like I'm responsible for the, for the forwards. I got to make sure that the forwards I put out don't fuck this thing up. And that, I mean, just speaking that out loud now, like, well, no shit, I had a bad, a a different mindset into how I'm going to approach this because I'm either going to overplay certain guys, underplay other guys, or just not have a good feel on what's appropriate given the game situation because I'm, I'm aware that it's harder to win here and that I need to, in my mind, I'm thinking I need to now operate differently and I need to make sure I do things a little differently than I used to. And I think ultimately, like when I, when we started winning, which is, I'm not saying we won because of the way I ran the bench, but when we started to find success and I also started to do things differently, it was more like I had done them in the past and more like I had operated previously. And like, 
for me, something that, I mean, I don't know, this is, everyone's different, but like I, you talk about like an anti-mentor and like your anti-goals. Like I, I never, you've got four lines, like use them. That doesn't mean that like everyone needs to play exactly equal, but to have a fourth line play six minutes and then a first line play 21, like why? I just, I like never really bought into that mindset, but I was definitely doing it sometimes when I was afraid to lose. I was like, we got to play our first line more or this line that is playing well today that I'm nominating as first. I got to play them more, play them more, play them more. And by the end of the, and that's not something I ever really did previously. Like um, I usually was pretty, pretty equal across the board. I was running the D, but still. Um, and I think by the end of the year, like when we started winning and I started having a different mindset, like the ice time was more equal and the opportunity was a lot more equal than it had been in the past. And if you're, if you're a guy who's on that perceived fourth line and you go from playing six to nine minutes, like you're telling me that, that the rising tide doesn't lift all boats, like that guy being, being happy and that line feeling more valued doesn't help the whole team eventually win. Like, of course it does. Um, so yeah, I think that's at least a big part of why I had the mindset I did going into the year was just that idea that this is harder to win now. Yeah. And it's, I mean, whether it's the cultural, like bigger picture piece that I shared in my story, and then it's the same, you're pulling on the same threads of, you had this idea that was more true to who you were and for whatever reason through outside influence through getting in your own head whatever um reverted back kind of regressed and then again with reflection through this conversation through other reflection you've been able to kind of have an aha moment and be like you know what i did get away from who I was and what, you know, we're talking about the edge and the edge is you. And I think that's a good place to kind of, we can give some wrap up thoughts if you have anything else, but it's whether it's the speaker you talked about, whether it's my story, your story, it's, you can get caught in the same, the same trap, but in three different scenarios. Mine was more macro. Yours was on the bench during a game uh, and his was a little bit in between. So. Um, you got anything you want to add just wrapping up? I would just say like, just kind of reiterating what, what you just went over there. Like there are a lot of ways to get to the same end result of that edge being yourself. Um, what kind of, like I mentioned earlier, like what worked for me, um, this year might not even work for me next year. So that means that like what works for me doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for someone listening or for you. And it really is an exercise in like self observation and self reflection, figure out what, what is your edge? What are things that you do really well? What are things that are truly, I know it's a buzzword, but it is a real word in the English dictionary. Like what is authentic to you and to your style of things and Figuring all of that out will help you not only identify your edge, but identify when you're maybe getting away from your edge. And that is when, when you, when you get away from it, it's when you want to be able to have like the self checks in there to recognize, like I'm getting away from maybe what I kind of believe in or what I've always done, um, that I know is successful and helpful for me. I need to get back to that. It'd be great if I had a self check that would have led me to that result before we dropped a weekend of games um, to a team that we really felt like we had a good chance of taking points from. Um, so like now my job is to make sure I have better self checks in place to identify those things next year before we lose games. Um, so whatever that looks like for you or anyone else, like try to identify what those self checks are and how you can implement them so that it doesn't take an external factor to bring you to that realization. Yeah. I'm not even going to add anything to that. Uh, we're going to wrap up. That was, that was well said. Um, have, and like, we're not going to spoon feed you filter questions. This is the one thing I will add um, and give you a template to work from. Cause we've already talked about how 
it doesn't need to be that way. But take some time today or whenever you get time, whenever you're listening to this, uh, driving in the car, think of some filter questions where what does it look like when I'm getting away from myself? What does that feel like internally? What does that look like externally? And now I'm starting to give them away, so I'll stop talking. And we will see you on episode five.